A Fearful Terror Fear comes in many forms. It has the capacity to cause dread, anxiety, and nervousness. Fear is one of the most powerful tools that exists to facilitate control over somebody. Think back to when you were a small child and the things that frightened you. Many of them have a universal applicability. How many times did you cry out to your mother or father in the night because you were frightened of the monsters under the bed and you were terrified that once the bedroom door was closed that something would come creeping out of the wardrobe and induce utter fear throughout you? Perhaps it was the strange shapes that formed once the light was turned off, with only the moonlight streaming through the crack in the curtains so that that particular shadow thrown across the room appeared like some old crone waiting to come and take you away and eat you. How many times were you warned as a child never to speak to strangers, never to get into a car with somebody you did not know, and never to accept sweets from a stranger? Do you recall how this conjured up images of smelly old men in stained raincoats who waited to abduct you and spirit you away to be locked up who knows where? Perhaps there was that house on your walk back from the school which had attracted a certain reputation. It was run down, the garden overgrown with bushes spilling onto the path the windows grimy and paint peeling. You were never sure whether anybody actually lived there. Some said that a witch resided there, and she waited for children passing on their own before grabbing them and stuffing them in her cellar to starve to death and then to use bits of their bodies for her potions. Others told tales on stormy afternoons which made the hairs on the back of your neck stand up about the spirits that haunted the old house. A friend would swear that he had walked past one wet and windy evening just as it was going dark and he saw the face of a ghostly child staring at him from an upstairs window, the child's spectral hands knocking against the window as if pleading for help. After hearing that tale, you took a different route home from school so you did not have to pass this particular house anymore. It affected your behaviour. If it was not possible to take an alternative route, you would run past head down, shouting at the top of your voice to drown out any strange sounds that might come from the trapped ghost child as you dared not even look towards the house. Fear impacted upon your behaviour and your response. Fear often stalked your childhood and resulted in sleepless nights, nightmares, and a reluctance to go to bed. Do you remember being sent to bed and staring up the stairs towards the darkness, wondering what was waiting for you? How you did not want to appear scared in front of your parents, especially since they had let you stay up a while longer because you were a big boy or a big girl now? You wanted to hand those words back as you hovered, at the base of the stairs, the hallway colder than the living room from which you had ventured. How many times did the noise of the house settling, resulting in strange groans and creaks, convince you that somebody was waiting out of sight in a doorway, their heavy booted foot resting on the squeaky floorboard, a rusty axe clutched in greasy, long-nailed fingers? And did the sight of a clown have you running to hide in the folds of your mother's dress, that strange, leering and accentuated mouth creating panic in your tiny mind? What did that eerie clown have in mind for you? It might have been a reluctance to paddle barefooted in the sea or a river because you could not see where you were putting your feet. You felt something brush your foot, most likely seaweed, 
but in your mind, in that instance, some razor-toothed fish was about to take a bite from your ankle, or a crab was about to affix a pincer to your big toe. You turned and ran hollering from the edge of the sea back to the safety of the sandy beach. There may have been a murderer's alleyway in your town, a badly lit passageway between two roads, which was a convenient and easy shortcut during the day. But at night, the purported preserve of lurking knife merchants and yellow-toothed strangers who were just looking to pounce and take your life. You stood staring down the alleyway, trying to drive the rising fear from you, but it just would not go. Instead, you opted to walk the long way around. It took an extra 20 minutes, but at least you got home safely. Again, that fear affected your behaviour. Fear continued to stalk your life as you grew older. You might not be worried about the bogeyman anymore, but he has shapeshifted into the fear that comes with finding a lump about your body and not knowing what it is. Uncertainty about the business for which you work as you're tossing and turning at night. Wondering where the next paycheck will come from as you're similarly fearing for the future. Walking along a road, alone at night, and hearing footsteps behind you still causes your heart rate to increase somewhat. A glance over your shoulder as you cross the road to the other pavement only serves to heighten your worry as the hooded figure also crosses the road. Your step quickens as your fear increases and your mind floods with images of robbery, rape or murder. When alone in the house at night, the sound of a bang from upstairs as you sat on your sofa wondering what it was. What was that noise? What's up there? Was it something not of this world? A poltergeist, perhaps, hurling a buck against a wall? You cannot see what caused the noise and immediately the fear forms in the pit of your stomach, your racing mind conjuring up a score of unpleasant scenarios as you debate creeping upstairs to find out what it is. Fear takes hold of you and it makes your reasoning faulty. Fear is an emotion which clouds judgment. In some instances it will serve a purpose in causing you to retreat and escape something that is dangerous. But more usually, fear paralyzes, creates dread, uncertainty and poor decisions because it is an emotional response not based upon the evidence. Fear tightens around your throat, stopping you from calling out and turns your legs into stone so you are figurative petrified and unable to escape that unseen tormentor. Fear withers you, paralyzes you and you will do anything at all to escape that sensation of fear. It is pervasive, damaging and controlling. Fear is utilised by our kind to control you. Creating fear in you, fear of being physically assaulted, fear of having your money taken from you, fear of us leaving the relationship, fear of us taking away somewhere for you to live, even a fear of not hearing from us for a number of days, a fear that you've done something wrong, the silence creating a fear of what next. Fear is utilised by our kind as a clear way of controlling you. Fear is harnessed by the narcissist and is used against you. But for the most part, much of the fear is actually generated by your emotional thinking, causing you to catastrophize, to see matters as they are not actually the case. And fear is very common with the empathic victim. Now that is not to belittle that certain situations your fear is entirely genuine because of the behaviour that you have been subjected to and therefore you anticipate that it will happen again. 
But in other instances, it is misleading and prevents you from making the right decisions for you. Fear is an effective method of controlling you, both in terms of what we do, but also by your misleading emotional thinking. Accordingly, fear must be tackled, and prevalent is that fear within the empathic victim. To address that fear, and to understand how you can tackle and conquer it, and improve your situation by no longer being frightened, scared, anxious and upset, utilise the link in the description to access fear and the empathic victim for a detailed explanation as to how fear continues to affect you, but most importantly of all, what you can do about it to no longer be afraid.